Right, so uh, as we enter the uh, reps forum part of the AGM, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Parker Khan, who is Clinical Director of Diabetes at Portsmouth Hospital NHS Trust since 2009. And one of his main areas of passion is improving patient outcomes through the redesign of diabetes care to be more integrated across primary and secondary care. He is the pioneer of the award-winning Super 6 model, and he has also lost several personal awards for his work. So we're very fortunate to have him with us today to tell us about the Super 6 model and how he's gone about redesigning diabetes care in Portsmouth. There's a lot that we can learn from the diabetes experience and from the Dr. Palmer's experience in particular. And obviously it's extremely relevant to our clinical networks project. So without further ado, Dr. Parker Cup. Yeah, um, afternoon everybody. Sorry about the slight delay. Uh, London's traffic is a bit challenging for somebody from Hampshire, let's just put it that way. We have much more open spaces than here. So um, I'll tell you about what we have done. It, um, it's a completely different disease process, so some of it may be relevant, some of it may be completely not relevant. But um, if you want, uh, if, if you think there's something worth there, then by all means ask. Um, a lot of what we have done is not rocket science, it's quite simple. Um, and uh, well, I'll talk you through it. There are articles on it. Uh, it's on there. It's freely available. We have been around uh, more than 70 CCGs so far talking about diabetes in particular. Is it applicable to any other specialty? Possibly, possibly not. But you, you can be the judge of that. Um, so 2008, I became a consultant. In 2009, uh, I took over as the clinical director because pretty much everybody else around me sat down uh, very quickly. And they said, uh, you look young. You should have a new challenge which is quite good. Um, so that's what we got. We got 630,000 is our population base and our register of people with diabetes about 29,000 which is about roughly around what the national average is. And we got a very mixed socioeconomic group and I put that in because it's relevant for a lot of uh, talks that I do in London amongst different CCGs because the socioeconomic divides are very different from different CCGs. So we have Hampshire uh, or Fairham, so that's your proper leafy Hampshire, the one that uh, builds your brochures, you know, green, leafy, jaguars, fur coats. And we also have uh, Cosham and Gosport, Gosport being the third poorest borough in the country. Uh, so you do have, at the same time, in pretty much the similar clinic, you'll have somebody walking in with their love, hate, selling their meters, or which they get from the department because it's very difficult to buy your day-to-day -day food. Uh, we had a specialty diabetes team which is based purely inside the acute trust. In those days we had two PCTs, then we had three CCGs, now there are two CCGs. So take it whichever way you want, we're pretty much back to where we were, just got a different name, which is fine. Um, in one of the CCGs or the PCTs we had that, which is we had 1.6 nurses in there and we had a general practitioner with special interest. But in Portsmouth CCG or PCT we had no team. So. You had the divide whereby it didn't matter if you came to the hospital, you had two different systems with two different PCTs, which created a lot of problem. So challenges for locality, and this, uh, funnily enough, on this slide, I keep on uh, updating my slide, but this particular slide, I don't have to change because that still stays the same. Uh, we are an acute trust. Uh, for those of you in the room uh, who would know this, we are a PFI, which is a privately funded in initiative signed by different governments. Uh, and we've got a mortgage to pay for that, which is heavily significant. So we've got the best looking hospital on the coast. Uh, we just don't have the money to pay for it. But apart from that, it's fine. Um, so the, so I, I, the way I look at a PFI is simply to say that you've got an eight bedded fantastic house, but you just have got the, actually got the remit to pay for four rooms. And the rest four, you're just bundling along as you go along. So we've got that. And this is a big question which people ask. Um, and I'll talk to you about whereby, you know, in our hospital, and later on I'll take questions, we talk to rheumatology colleagues and orthopedic colleagues and see what we're doing with this. That's a big question that's asked. So if you're trying to redefine acute hospital, what does a chronic disease specialist actually do inside an acute trust? So that's the traditional way that's always been. You've got primary care, you've GPs, and then if you've got a problem, you refer to the hospital. That was always the system. And then suddenly the drive came, irrespective of political colour, we need to move everything out in the community. So the question then became for us, if you're doing diabetes, what do you actually do? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but in plain, simple terms, it didn't really matter what target people put on uh, the hospital. They were all still coming in. And in one area, even though there was a community team, it really didn't matter because there were lots of GPs. There's a bit of a myth that GPs and 
consultants are always loggerheads. We actually get along very well most of the time. We have our fantastic Christmas parties, invite each other, get very drunk. So those GPs uh, actually loved us, and they went like, actually, we're not going to bother referring to the community team. We'll just bypass the system and refer you to the hospital. So everybody's happy. And I think, um, as a clinical director, one of the things, that there is no incentive in the system. And so the day before yesterday, I was in Parliament presenting this and talking about and one of the things we're looking at is, and those of you here will know that, payment by results probably kills us all at the moment. Uh, because look at it this way, um, if I get a referral from a general practitioner, would you look at it and go like, actually it doesn't need to come in. You also got to realize that clinically, yes, you could say, all right, I can do this over the phone. But financially, that's 239 pounds for me. If I turn that down, then what happens over an accumulated period? Who do you think, what do you think happens? I lose my admin and my nurses, uh, because consultants uh, don't lose jobs, I'll be very honest. Uh, we are very well protected, we're very, very well paid, and we've got plenty of arrows uh, in our strings. So if diabetes goes away, I'll turn around and do endocrinology, I'll do general medicine, I can do lots of stuff, but our nurses may not be, which is a problem. So you have this whole debate going on, well, if you refuse referrals, then you refuse the tariff, and if you refuse the tariff, you don't have the money, and if you don't have the money, how do you look after your department? So it goes around in circles. So this is where uh, our departmental view is. You know, I think the olden uh, thing that if you, uh, you went to see a consultant, a bit like the Lancelot Spratt model or whatever, who shouted at a few juniors and told the women to go and cook, uh, that's probably gone um, and should go as well. And you have the new age consultant, I would have thought, whereby there are some bits, which I don't think there should be any shame in saying that there are some bits I could do better than anybody else. That's not arrogance, that's not cockiness. I've been trained for 10 years by the taxpayers' money to do that. I don't expect anybody else to do it. I don't expect anybody else to run insulin pumps like I do uh, because I've trained for it, specifically in Kings. So it would be slightly uh, annoying if somebody else said that, wrong for patients, if somebody else said, I'll have a crack at it. But that's a niche area, in my view. The bigger area is here, and we'll talk about it. And these are terms, leadership accountability terms, which are bandied around. You know, you go to these Kings Fund, and I'm a part of King's Fund, you go to lots of other places, and they have lovely PowerPoints, you know, and you sit there, look at it, and go, I don't understand what you're talking about. It all sounds very woolly. And uh, leadership uh, accountability, do we have a, can we get to mature to a system where a consultant or the consultant group can be responsible for the patient's journey from the diagnosis till the end? Um, and also, at the same time, yeah, would you be ready to take the accountability for giving the responsibility? So, if you win your awards, by all means, go up and pick them up and get drunk. But if you fail in some parameters, then go in front of the media and explain why you haven't worked. So, a long way to go for that. So, this started off when I invited all the PCTs or the CCGs in those days, 2010. And it was quite interesting because I sent an email out and, um, to everybody saying, shall we meet up? And you know, uh, you all have Microsoft Outlook, you know, you, you, can have, you can read and it says read and you know people have read it. So it's very disconcerting when you, when you basically have two things which pop up, which is read and delete, which means they're reading it and just ignoring you. So I thought I'm going to try something which I was quite uh, efficient as when I was a registrar. So I sent an email out and said, shall we all meet for a drink? And I will buy. And I absolutely kid you not, everybody turned up. <laughs> so that was quite funny. So we met in a pub uh, because I, uh, I'm a big believer in trying to do it uh, in a much more relaxed setting. I think you need to get to know people rather than sitting around a table having, and uh, that's work for us. So the proposal I had is that if there's so much debate about diabetes care, where should we, why don't we discharge everybody from the hospital? Every single patient, let's just discharge all 5,000, press a button and say bye-bye. To which uh, one of the GPs in the room says, what would you do? To which I... I, I, I always said that, you know, I, I, people really should stop worrying about me because, you know, I come from India originally, so I can go back and set up a shop and I'll be a millionaire in probably three days flat because they don't have primary care or secondary care. They're a private-based system. They would love me. I've been trained in the UK, you know, very special. Um, but one of the GPs in that room also said, but that's not quite fair because there were some bits there which is not right. I said, why do you say it's not right? He said, well, because financially it doesn't make sense, clinically it doesn't make sense. And I asked for an example, and he said, pregnancy and diabetes. And I said, well, it doesn't make sense to put an obstetrician, a midwife, a consultant, all in one van and go from surgery to surgery. The numbers don't make sense. It makes sense to put them all in one place, which would be the hospital. 
and that's what came that's what came to rise you know uh, I called it a super six it wasn't anything special I picked the name I absolutely kid you not when I was watching a rugby sevens game um, I'm a big rugby fan I watch rugby and somebody got sent off and they said the team's playing like a super six and I said I'll have that uh, because we are in an era where uh, branding is very big you know branding is huge you know uh, everybody knows about the super six diabetes model not because it's amazing uh, but because it's got a name to it and that's the sadness of where we are but there we go but if you look at it, none of it really is rocket science. So inpatient hospitals, I people, in, you know, if you've got an orthopedic ward room, everybody's got diabetes. So would it make a lot of sense if you had input into all those areas, people coming in for surgery, diabetes, quicken up the pace, not everybody needs to be admitted overnight. And that's what we do now uh, with all our orthopedic colleagues, vascular, everything. So we've got dedicated teams in sitting inside each of those wards. That's got nothing to do with primary care, but that will help the agenda of quickening up discharges, making sure patients are seen better. And uh, we've always had this debate because I've got very good links with our orthopedic colleagues and one of the things um, I always say is that th there is this whole debate about we need to teach everybody everything. So the orthopedic surgeon should know everything about insulin. I said, well, not really, uh, because that's, I would rather he is very good at doing my knee rather than ha being half cock at everything. So my view is I would be there to help you if you are struck with something. I'm, all I'm asking you is to know the basics. If you've got diabetes, they need some insulin. Don't stop that, this thing sort of thing. The other ones, financially, makes also make a lot of sense because MDT tariffs, commissioners like it. It's in one place. You've got double expertise, triple expertise in one place. Pregnancy and diabetes, feet and diabetes. So we do that with the vascular surgeon, podiatry, and us with dedicated slots for orthopedics in case you've got foot reconstruction or something. Insulin pumps. Adolescent type 1 diabetes, you're 16, 17, 18 year olds who are notoriously difficult. And uh, kidney functions, we are a tertiary renal unit, so dialysis machines, etc. So what is the situation locally? Uh, this is what we got, really. So we said, rather than, and I, one of the things from this model uh, is that there is no point in hiring a separate community specialist. Because if you think of it, uh, the community specialist's role uh, is simply put, try to stop people from coming into the hospital. That's his role. The hospital consultant's job is to stop people from going out of the hospital. Because that's his job. And his job depends on it. So it is very difficult for them to become really good friends because both of your jobs are on the line. Uh, I, I, and whatever you say, at the end of the day, uh, I, I go to all these meetings and people think that we're all in this for the altruistic nature of it. Yeah, probably there is a bit of it as a doctor, but there is also the salary at the end of the month, which pays your bills, which pays for your um, girlfriend's request for shoes or, uh, I don't know, when your kid's going to private school, whatever be the case. If that is hurt, your altruism flies out of the window. So I think people need to take that into mind when they say that you know, people should just drop money and start doing it for love. So 52 we cover for consultants. Uh, we cover the community team and we have a phone service at the end of the day because we said, look, it's chronic disease. If it's that acute, somebody's got diabetic ketoacidosis, there is no phone call in the entire world which will stop them from coming in. They are coming in and they need to be seen quick, fast in the, on the front door. But you can do it at the end of the day. So we had a long debate what time of the day is, rather than keeping it open all the time through the day, and you can't get hold of people because everybody's busy within hospitals. So we said, why don't we do it at the end of the day, which works. We've got an NHS.net email, which we have to do for governance purposes. I'll talk to you what we do about the visits to the GP surgeries, and we are marked on what we do and what we don't do. So patients were discharged, but we didn't discharge anybody with the press of a button. We actually sent a list to each surgery of the patients that were outside the six super clinics and said, here are the patients, we don't fit the lists. What do you think? So we give them four, six weeks to look to the list along with their surgery partners and they came back as a green or red. Green, we agree. Red, we don't. And what we did in the first visits that we did for the GP surgery, we went to the red. This is why they couldn't be handled in the community if they knew the setup that was already there. And this is what we do when we go to the GP surgery. We're giving everybody an options. We can do virtual clinics, audits, educational sessions. We do patient reviews. And there's the, this is the second fundamental basis, is that we do not case hold. If you build a community team and you ask them to case hold in another building, you might as well send those patients to the hospital. Because uh, I'm afraid the hospital actually is part of the community. So to say things like, I'm going to move people into the community makes very little sense to me because the hospital has always traditionally been part of the whole community. So if you're going to set up shop somewhere else, then you might as well do it in the GP surgery but with the GP or the practice nurse. Otherwise, there's no education involved. Because if you're going to do it somewhere else, 
then it's just another point for the general practitioner to refer. I can't see where the education involved is. They're still dependent on a letter which they were getting from the hospital, so why not just keep it in the hospital? So that's the principle. And a review of database to discuss patients regarding cough targets, obviously very important for GP surgeries because that is their lifeblood. Now we further on went through a tender for the second PCT. Anybody here been through a tender? It is the most painful experience in your whole life, isn't it? Fantastically good fun. We had seven bidders, two NHS, five non-NHS. We had Americans. Uh, it was great fun. Um, and um, has anybody seen Minority Report? <coughs> seen Minority Report? Ooh. Yeah. You know, you see Tom Cruise doing that, moving things around, and yeah. I sat through a presentation like that. It was brilliant. It's just a shame they knew nothing about diabetes, but I tell you what, they were brilliant. I even said to Virgin as to whether they would give me free air mines for every single patient I saw. They didn't see the funny side of that. But it was very painful, and it was a lot, a lot of wastage of money. And what I say now to lots of CCGs, try and work with your local trusts and local clinicians to try and make this happen without going through a whole t painful tendering process if you can avoid it. If you have to do it, you have to do it because of competition laws and everything. But if you can avoid it, then that's great. So we've got three providers in the region, contracts placed in all three, and we've got a consultant body who's integrated link between all organisations. So there is no separate community team. It's the same people, in and out. That's the sort of key to this. So if I see somebody in a GP surgery with a foot problem, I don't need to do a letter or referral, and I don't need to wait for three weeks. I can take the name, and I can put them into the clinic pretty much the next day. That works for everybody concerned. So this is what we've done. Actually, the list needs to be updated. We've crossed 1,000, so we have discharged a heck of a lot of patients from secondary care. We have transferred a lot of patients to the right clinics, and our general diabetes referrals, if you think of those, those of you who don't do diabetes, if you think of it, beyond those six things, all of them can be dealt by phones and emails, which is what we have done. Nurses, linchpin of the service, we look after them as much as we can do uh, because they take a major hit on the service uh, um, because, and they can do that because they're not going around just sitting down in the clinic seeing patients. Their emails, their phones, they go around, visit surgeries, do the clinics with the practice nurses. Uh, we are monitoring whether we pick up the phones or not, so they answer the emails, uh, so we have to do that. Um, we have completed all the GP surgery visits, so the fourth, fifth visits now are much more structured. So when we, so we get the GPs to pick their visit between the four of us, four consultants. We say yes, one of us. And what we ask is on those visits is that uh, the GP lead for that particular specialty is there, along with the practice nurse. We go there with the specialist nurse and we discuss cases. We go through patients. We do co-ops. We do audits. And there's a lot of things where we can help GPs save a lot of money with medicines management in our business, so to speak, or inappropriate referrals. Uh, so patients' feedback was taken by CCGs as well, so everybody's very happy, which is great. Our primary care colleagues love us. All those bottles of wine are working very well. But that's the whole point. The CCGs, you have to put your neck on the line and have key performance indicators to say whether it's working or not. So, so far... Everybody seems happy, which basically stops it from being retender or anything else. You just have a rolling contract right now. Lots of recognition, which is great. I think, and um, it's not uh, for, for me. It's very important for this because there's nothing like this which builds the morale of the team. Uh, because for consultants, we get lots of recognitions. We have CEA points. We have this. We have that. It's all fine. But I don't think nurses necessarily get that or admin stuff. So when we go to this BMJ awards, it's one of the best teams in the country. Uh, because this is Portsmouth, this is my team, we went in a limo uh, with lots of light and sparkly bulbs and stuff in it. It was great fun, great for morale, great fun. We had a great night and we do that all the year. And this year also we've been shortlisted with quite a few. We're up for the Guardian Awards. Uh, we're the, I think we're the only two NHS trusts which are up, which is because it's against the public sector, private and voluntary sector. But that's good to be recognised from that sort of work. So that's what we've got to. We've got 80 GP surgeries we covered between four consultants, um, and pretty much one team, uh, one plan, one model, um, and it's been two and a half years. These are some of our long-term outcomes trying to come out. Our diabetic ketoacidosis. So people said nationally we faced a lot of challenge when we started off. People said all the, evidently all the patients will start marching in the streets after being discharged from the fantastic consultants, um, and uh, they will all come into the front door. Well, our DK admissions have gone down by actually 16%, but more impressively, our hypoglycemic admissions have gone down by about 33%. And we haven't done anything dramatic. We just said, gone out and said, okay, if a patient's 92 year old, can you stop giving them so much insulin and making them fall down and break their hips? Because there is no evidence in the whole world 
that uh, they need to have tighter glucose control. But that's the problem of cough because it drives you towards it. But there's no clinical evidence behind it. Um, and in the words of Edwin Gale, a professor based in Bristol, he always says that you're in the business of making people better, not immortal. So I think people sometimes forget that probably. So there we are. So we've got these new things in play. Um, we run these education programs for the whole community, which is free, commissioned by our CCGs, working with pharma. So it's a very straightforward uh, agreement uh, by the CCG as to how we work it. We do patient meets, make it a little bit more fun. We served them bacon butties. It was the FA Cup final. So we said after the day, you can sit down. But I'll tell you what we did with this, that there was, a, as always, an, an ulterior motive, because we invited everybody, including the commissioners, to this meeting. And we said to the patients, tell them what's not working. So first hand listening. If you think always the professional is saying the right thing, listen to the patients. That's how we managed to actually bolster up our adolescent service, because they listened to about 60, 70 patients saying, we don't have any psychologists, we don't know where to turn, which is very useful. We do transition clinics, and you know, I think the results are good. Um, this is an example of where your CCG needs to be strong and back you, because of those 80 surgeries, three surgeries refuse to play. So we send them everything. We send them emails, phones, chocolates, flowers, love, charm, nothing. Didn't like it. Didn't want it. And we had a discussion with the CCGs where to go with there. And um, my view to this is that if the outcomes are good in those particular surgeries, then as a consultant, you don't have any God-given right to go in. Because they're doing the right thing. That's right for patients. No, no place for egos. But if they're not, then they're playing politics. And they found out who weren't. And the CCGs basically cracked the whip. And we went in. And it was good, actually, because they didn't know what we were doing. Because they thought we were coming to monitor them, which is what, not with the intention, there's no monitoring at all involved. So the relationships have involved, have improved quite significantly over the years. We all of us know each other, it's been two and a half years now by their first name, etc. And what tends to happen, and one of the good markers, when we first went in there, we used to have like a plastic glass of water sitting there for you. Nowadays you have lunch and all that, so it must be, they must be getting, getting to know us better than before. So I'm going to finish over this, because you know, does anybody know whose quote that is? Steve Jobs. Hmm? No, it's not. Steve Jobs. Yeah, Steve Jobs. So, um, Steve Jobs is uh, one of my big heroes, an innovator outside the box, um, told to sort of go away. Okay. But, you know, I think that's right because, you know, I, I always said as a, you know, I've got uh, very good colleagues all across the board and I always say, you've got to, got to turn around in 10 years. Now, I, love my, I, love my, I enjoy my life. I have a very social life and I, I do my work as much as I can do for what I'm paid for. But you've got to turn around in 10 years' time and not sit in a, a bar and mope over a beer. You've got to turn around and say, I gave it my best shot. It didn't work. At least I tried. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, lots of CCGs are trying to understand the financial structures, which is what we advise on, because it actually didn't, lot, uh, didn't result in anybody losing a significant sum of money, because the consultants work differently. And we dropped our PAs and moved the PAs across to different trusts. We did save them a lot of money. We actually, one nurse, we said we don't need her because she, was in, she went away, we didn't replace her. So there was a lot of savings for everybody concerned. Um, and at the moment, they're getting the returns to the front door. But you need to give it time. So uh, you can't expect it to happen straight away in one spreadsheet of a financial year. So that, that's what we have had support from and our CCGs and GPs have been doing. So that's where it is. So thank you. That's it.